Okay, we're, we're coming to like, our final session of the conference, um, and I'll introduce our speaker. I'm very excited that we managed to get Bruce to agree to be our keynote this year. We've been trying for a few years, so I'm, I'm personally thrilled that Bruce is our keynote. Um, so Bruce is a tenured professor at Georgetown's University's Walsh School of Foreign Service, and he's been studying terrorism and insurgency for over four decades. I've known him for over two, so it's been a long time. He's the visiting professor of terrorism studies at St. Andrews University in Scotland. He's previously held the corporate chair in counterterrorism and counterinsurgency at the RAND Corporation. He's written countless books and articles. Probably most of us have either read them or included them on our reading lists. And I'm really pleased to hand over to Bruce. We'll have questions at the end. And if we do it like yesterday, if you come up to the mic and actually ask a question, um, that'll be great, because I'm sure he'll have quite a few. So over to you, Bruce. Four decades of studying terrorism have also wrecked my eyesight, so I just first put on my glasses, I won't be able to see anything. Uh, thank you very much, Rachel, for the extremely kind um, introduction, um, and indeed for the invitation to give the closing uh, keynote address at this conference. Listening to Jim Piazza's excellent keynote yesterday and to many of the seminars over the past two days, I was struck, actually, at how far the terrorism studies field has come. Um, those of you with particularly long memories may recall a piece that appeared in the New Yorker in October, November 2001, shortly after the uh, epochal 9-11 attacks, where um, a specialist in the field, a well, specialist in the broader social science discipline, described those who study terrorism as regarded within the field as somewhat akin to movie theater ushers in terms of their uh, status and, and distinction. And I have to say, as head of a security studies program that's nested within the broader international relations subfield and political science discipline, uh, it's, it's often made apparent to me how outside of the mainstream many of us are and most of our work is sometimes um, regarded with scholars of terrorism, often dismissed, denigrated, or ignored. Um, but I think the reason for this derision is also the strength of our um, subject. And that's because of its policy relevance and often real-time impact on real-life decisions, sometimes directly involving genuine issues of life and death. And certainly a lot of the research that has been presented over the past two days at this conference, I think, underscores, firstly, how far the field has come and how much is, it has grown, but also, the undeniable importance of our research to, after all, countering an insidious phenomena that shows no signs of, of, of unfortunately, after four decades of studying it, no signs of decreasing, uh, but rather becoming more intractable. I would say, too, that the other ineluctable strength of the field is the one that's really been very clearly in evidence over the past two days and is very much embodied by the Society for Terrorism Research. And that's both the multidisciplinary approach that has really been on show throughout this conference, but often paired with the interdisciplinary work that has enlivened and underscores much of the research um, um, presented here. So as among one of the original cadre of terrorism specialists that was once uh, ennobled uh, to the status of movie theater ushers, I'm deeply honored um, to present this final keynote to you. And I hope you'll in indulge me in highlighting some of the aspects of the third edition of Inside Terrorism. Um, I've been uh, enormously fortunate and indeed grateful to all of you that this is a book that has remained continuously in print for over 19 years. Anybody who follows my Twitter knows that the third edition is imminently forthcoming. In fact, I was meeting with my publisher at Columbia University Press uh, this morning, Uptown, who assured me that copies would be delivered in time for the fall semester, 
which knowing the timelines and time lags of university presses is no, no easy, easy feat. Um, but I thought what I would do is really bring together some of the material from the final three chapters of the book in a, in hi, in a highly digestible um, um, uh, uh, format. And I want to cover sort of the four areas that went into this updated version, which I think, I think I've added 30 or 40,000 uh, new words or so to. Um, first and foremost, and, and this is all in a very brief presentation because I'm mindful of the fact that after two long days, um, a long and very uh, and, and, and uh, very detailed presentation is what no one wants. So I want to briefly cover the new threat posed by ISIS, Al Qaeda's stubborn resiliency, the role of the social media in abetting, facilitating um, terrorist recruitment and radicalization, alongside its key role in operational planning and execution. And in this respect, too, one of the elements that I want to highlight is something that has also fallen out of the fashion in the past 15 to 16 years since the Iraq WMD uh, debacle. And that's the element of warning, which once had a very prominent role as an historical pillar of both intelligence and terrorism studies, but in recent years um, seems to have uh, fallen by um, the wayside. Um, before I begin, let me again thank the organizers of the conference for inviting me to give this keynote, and especially Rachel uh, Monahan, um, to show you what a tight network the community of terrorism scholars is. So over 20 years ago, I was the external examiner of a PhD thesis that I've watched with great admiration as Rachel's career has flourished and blossomed since. And finally, just to give you an idea of how multidisciplinary the field has become, in contrast to Jim's excellent presentation yesterday, I'm not a political scientist, so I come at it from much more of an historical and empirical dimension. So that's sort of the thrust that I will introduce. And also in a very old-fashioned way, um, unfortunately, standing before you wearing a jacket and tie, you can see that I'm a previous generation of, of scholars, which also means when you're asked to give a keynote, it's, I always feel it's incumbent upon someone at this very august moment to actually read a prepared paper rather than to speak more extemporaneously from notes. So I hope I won't bore you by actually reverting to the old form and reading a, reading a paper. OK, so let me begin. Light up the fire on the flowing crowd. Pour grenades on the crusader's head. Don't have mercy until he's broken. This was the encrypted message that a Moroccan-born ISIS operative in Italy received from his commanders in the Middle East via WhatsApp last year. Although the Italian authorities were able to thwart the series of attacks planned for that country, their French, Belgian, Turkish, German, and British counterparts have been tragically less successful in preventing the succession of bloody ISIS-inspired or directed incidents that have convulsed Europe since 2015. Indeed, according to one compilation, ISIS to date has carried out 150 attacks in over two dozen a country, in over two dozen countries that excluding the ongoing carnage in Syria and Iraq have claimed the lives of more than 2,000 persons. There was a time not so long ago when the conventional wisdom was that ISIS's violence would somehow remain confined to the perennially volatile and sanguinary Levant in Iraq. That wishful thinking was swept aside on November 13, 2015, by the biggest terrorist attack on a Western city in over a decade. With no, with no advance warning, and in defiance of the prevailing analytical assumption that ISIS wasn't even interested in mounting external operations, and indeed lacked the capability to do so, six simultaneous attacks killed 130 persons and wounded nearly 400 others. Just two weeks earlier, the group was similarly able to perpetrate the single most significant attack against commercial aviation in over a decade. A bomb placed on a Russian charter flight exploded shortly after departing Sharm el Sheikh, killing all 224 persons on board. The fact that ISIS has continued to pose a salient threat to Europe's security for a second summer in a row should make us very circumspect about any conception we may have about fully understanding ISIS's capabilities and intentions, much less the threat that it will continue to pose 
after the fall of Mosul and then Raqqa, and even beyond in a post-caliphate world. Because of ISIS's emergence and Al-Qaeda's stubborn resilience, today we arguably face the most parlous security environment since the period immediately following the September 11th attacks. With serious terrorist threats emanating from not one, but two terrorist movements who have both cultivated a myriad of branches and affiliates, thus enhancing their capabilities and ensuring their longevity. Their respective harnessing and exploitation of social media has played a significant role in fostering this lamentable situation. ISIS, alas, is here to stay, at least for the foreseeable future. Some two years before the 2015 Paris attacks, ISIS had built an external operations network in Europe that mostly escaped notice. Known as the Amin al karji or simply as Enmi or Omni, the respective Turkish and Arabic rendering of the word Omniat or security service, this unit appears to function independently of the group's waning military and territorial fortunes. For instance, US defense and intelligence officials quoted by Rukmini Kalamaki in her revealing New York Times article from exactly a year ago, believed that ISIS had already sent hundreds of, hundreds of operatives into the European Union, with hundreds more having been dispatched to Turkey as well. If accurate, this investment of operational personnel ensures that ISIS will retain an effective international terrorist strike capability in Europe irrespective of its battlefield reversals in Iraq and Syria. ISIS's leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, has already instructed potential foreign fighters who are unable to travel to the caliphate to instead emigrate to other vilayets or branches where ISIS has outposts. This suggests that these other branches will likely develop their own external operations capabilities independent of the parent organization and themselves present significant future threats, much as Al-Qaeda's franchises have over the past decade in Yemen, North Africa, and South Asia. The alleged involvement of ISIS's Libyan branch in last May's horrific bombing of a Manchester concert venue points to the realization of al-Baghdadi's diktat. Moreover, in addition to the presumed sleeper cells that ISIS has seeded throughout Europe, there is the further problem of at least some of the estimated 7,000 European foreign fighters either returning home or migrating elsewhere to carry on the struggle. They are only a fraction of the nearly 40,000 persons from more than 120 countries throughout the world who have trained in Syria and Iraq. What this means is that in little more than four years, ISIS's international cadre has surpassed even the most liberal estimates of the number of foreign fighters that the US intelligence community believes journeyed to Afghanistan during the 1980s and 1990s in order to join Al Qaeda. In other words, far more foreign nationals have been trained by ISIS in Syria and Iraq during the past couple of years than were by Al Qaeda in the dozen or so years leading up to the September 2001 attacks. This recreates the same constellation of organizational capabilities and trained operatives that made Al-Qaeda so dangerous a decade and a half ago. And unlike the comparatively narrow geographical dimensions of prior Al-Qaeda recruits, ISIS's foreign fighter cadre includes hitherto unrepresented or underrepresented nationalities, such as hundreds of Latin Americans, along with citizens from Mali, Benin, Bangladesh, and the small Caribbean island state of Trinidad and Tobago, among other places, or among other atypical jihadi recruiting grounds. Meanwhile, the danger from so-called lone wolf attacks also remains. The late ISIS commander Abu Muhammad al-Adnani's famous September 2000 and 2014 summons to battle has hitherto proven far more compelling than Al-Qaeda's longstanding efforts similarly to animate, motivate, and inspire individuals to engage in violence in support of its aims. Utilizing a variety of freely available social 
networking platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, and Flickr, among others, terrorists and insurgent groups today have introduced an even more direct and personally intimate form of messaging. ISIS has positioned itself at the forefront of this new revolution in terrorist communications. Indeed, since 2014, it has produced and disseminated a succession of increasingly more heinous and grisly propaganda videos of brutal executions and similar depredations that have captured the attention of a new generation of terrorist recruits. These videos and their unrestrained exaltation of violence have attracted far more viewers than Osama bin Laden's and Ayman al-Zawahiri's comparatively priggish presentations recanting complex theological treatises or imparting didactic, philosophical, and historical lectures. Where Al-Qaeda and its affiliates saw the internet as a place to disseminate material anonymously or to meet in dark places, Robert Hannigan, the director of the UK government communications headquarters, GCHQ notes, ISIS has embraced the web as a noisy channel in which to promote itself, intimidate people, and radicalize new recruits. ISIS has thus been remarkably effective in its use of these social media to speak to a global audience, thereby completely bypassing and thwarting the traditional media from misinterpre misinterpreting or otherwise distorting its core message. A common ISIS propaganda mantra, accordingly, is don't hear about us, hear from us. These social media platforms facilitate both ubiquitous and real-time communication between like-minded radicals with would-be recruits and potential benefactors. The phenomenon of narrow casting. Also called niche marketing or target marketing, Gabi Weiman, the renowned, Israeli tele, the, around, the renowned Israeli terrorist communications expert, explains, narrow casting aims media messages at specific segments of the public, defined by characteristics such as values, preferences, attributes, or location. Ease, interactivity, networking, reach, frequency, usability, stability, immediacy, publicity, and permanence are among the benefits to terrorist groups like ISIS who have nimbly adapted these technologies for their nefarious purposes. I don't think it is far-fetched to say that the internet is a major reason why ISIS is so successful and so worrying. An unnamed American intelligence officer commented in a May 2016 article detailing ISIS's mastery of digital media and technology. ISIS fighters in Syria and Iraq, accordingly, have individually amassed thousands of followers on platforms such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. They have communicated with their audiences, often on a daily basis, and sometimes multiple times each day, providing firsthand immediate accounts of heroic battles and more mundane daily activities, thus making jihad accessible and comprehensible on a uniquely intimate and personal basis. These fighters invite, motivate, anima animate, and summon their digital media followers and friends and other online contacts to come to Syria and Iraq and partake of the holy war against the apostate regimes of Bashar al-Assad and Haider al-Abadi. Blatant sectarian messages coupled with divinely ordained clarion calls to resist Persian domination and decisively affect the outcome of the eternal struggle between Sunni and Shia and the latter's Alawite satraps provide additionally compelling incentives. Indeed, a 2014 ISIS recruitment video circulated via social media featured heavily armed militants with distinctive British and Australian accents trumpeting the virtues of jihad and the ineluctable religious imperative of joining the caravan of martyrs. Through these voices, the group is able to tailor its messages to specific target audiences back in these fighters' own neighborhoods, schools, clubs, community centers, and mosques. Whereas the older versions of terrorist websites effectively were waiting for visitors to arrive, Gabi Weiman argues, a social networking approach allows terrorists to reach their target audiences and virtually knock on their doors. 
ISIS's unbridled visual depictions of particularly gruesome executions and other wanton acts of violence galvanize the attention of this select audience and beseech them to join ISIS's struggle. A new generation of celebrity fighters, accordingly, has been created to facilitate this process. Ultraviolence, as Jessica Stern and J.M. Berger turn this phenomenon, sold well with the target demographic for foreign fighters, angry, maladjusted young men whose blood stirred at images of grisly beheadings and the crucifixion of so-called apostates. Other types of appeals, utilizing more traditional messages intended for mainline religious audiences, are also used by ISIS to target this entirely different demographic. Familiar historical and theological references are invoked for this particular audience's consideration, and specific solicitations are directed to the descendants of pious families of ancient, respected lineage and stature. ISIS propagandists also portray the organization as messengers and executors of apocalyptic prophecies, promising the imminence of an inevitable clash between the forces of good and evil in an epic, decisive battle as part of a compelling narrative with which to target potential recruits. These themes both resonate with and have a very powerful effect on their intended audiences. According to Will McCants, ISIS's eschatological arguments have infused the group with newfound momentum producing, as he writes, an inrush of foreign fighters to Syria, many of them seeking a role in the end time drama. For terrorists today, the advantages of these new social media are thus as profound as they are manifold. It is therefore also not surprising to find that all of Al-Qaeda's most important affiliates, Al-Shabaab, Ansar al-Sharia, the Abdullah Azam Brigades, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and the Afghan Taliban, all have Twitter accounts on which they regularly tweet, or had Twitter accounts on which they regularly tweeted. In fact, during its lethal assault on Nairobi's Westgate shopping center in September 2013, Al-Qaeda's Somali branch, Al-Shabaab, provided live, ongoing commentary of the attack in Kenya over Twitter. In this respect, it should be noted that while ISIS has dominated the headlines and preoccupied our attention for the past four years, Al-Qaeda has meanwhile been quietly rebuilding and marshaling its resources for the continuation of its 20-year-old struggle. Indeed, its presence in Syria should be regarded as just as dangerous and even more pernicious than ISIS. The priority that Al-Qaeda attaches to Syria may be seen in the special messages conveyed in February and June 2012, respectively, by Ayman al-Zawahiri and the late Abu Yahya al-Libi in support of the uprising against the Assad regime calling upon fellow Muslims in Turkey, Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon to do everything within their power to assist the overthrow of the apostate Alawites. The fact that Jabhat al-Nusra or Jabhat Fatah al-Sham or Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, regardless of what it calls itself today, is even more capable than ISIS and a more dangerous and long-term threat seems completely immaterial to many across the region who not only actively support and assist al-Qaeda's Syrian arm, but actively seek to partner with what they perversely regard as a more moderate and reasonable rival to ISIS. These deliberate obfuscations, both to eschew the al-Qaeda name and portray its most important franchise in a distinctively more benign light than ISIS, is a reflection of a calculated strategic choice taken by al-Zawahiri at a pivotal moment in al-Qaeda's history. In 2013, he instructed the movement's fighters to avoid mass casualty operations in order not to cause the death of Muslim civilians and innocent women and children. The legacy of this edict is evident in a tweet by a Dutch fighter belonging to HTS, who eagerly reminded his followers that unlike ISIS, Al-Qaeda focuses mostly on political and military targets instead of civilians. This development may be seen as fitting neatly into al-Zawahiri's broader strategy of letting ISIS take all the heat and absorb all the blows from the coalition arrayed against it, 
while Al-Qaeda quietly rebuilds its military strength and basks in its paradoxical cachet as quote unquote, moderate extremists in contrast to the unconstrained ISIS. Anyone inclined to be taken in by this ruse would do well to heed the admonition of Theo Podnos, um, also known as Peter Theo Curtis, the American journalist who spent two years in Syria as a hostage of what was then called Jabhat al-Nusra. Pados related in a New York Times article how the Nusra front higher-ups were inviting Westerners to the jihad in Syria, not so much because they needed more foot soldiers. They didn't. But because they want to teach the Westerners to take the struggle into every neighborhood and subway back home. Finally, the importance of Syria to al-Qaeda's grander plans may be seen in the number of the group's senior commanders who have operated there. Moussa al-Fadli, a bin Laden intimate who until his death from a US airstrike in 2015 commanded the Khorasan group, al-Qaeda's elite four deployed operational arm in Syria. Haider Kirkan, a Turkish national and longstanding senior al-Qaeda commander, had been sent back to his homeland, presumably by bin Laden himself in 2010. His orders were to build an infrastructure in the region to facilitate the movement of key personnel fighting, hiding, in pa pa no, sorry, hiding in Pakistan's federally administered tribal area in order to escape the escalation of drone strikes ordered by President Obama. Kir Khan was killed last fall as a result of a US bombing raid near Idlib, Syria. And in late 2015, al-Zawahiri dispatched Saif al adil al-Qaeda's most experienced and battle-hardened senior commander to Syria in order to oversee the group's interests there. With this senior command structure in place, Al-Qaeda is thus well positioned to exploit ISIS's weakening military position and territorial losses, and once again regain its preeminent position at the vanguard of the Salafi jihadi movement. ISIS, in any event, can no longer compete with Al-Qaeda in terms of resiliency, reach, manpower, and organizational cohesion. In only one domain is ISIS currently stronger than its rival the ability to mount spectacular terrorist strikes in Europe. And this is only because Al-Qaeda has apparently decided for the time being to restrain this type of operation. Looking to the immediate future, ISIS's continuing setbacks and serial weakening arguably create the conditions where some reconciliation with Al-Qaeda might yet be affected. Efforts to reunite have been continuous from both sides virtually from the time of ISIS's expulsion from the Al-Qaeda fold. Regardless of how it might occur, any kind of reconciliation between ISIS and Al-Qaeda or any kind of reamalgamation would profoundly change the current conflict and result in a significantly escalated threat of foreign fighter terrorist operations around the globe. Regardless of ISIS's future prospects, it has incontestably reshaped the nature of both terrorist communications and operations these past three years. This suggests that its impact will be felt and its influence will continue for a long time. Terrorism from this enemy in the past came in either one or two forms. The first entailed the long established, directly controlled and tightly orchestrated operation involving trained terrorists with an identifiable command, control, and communication chain of command. While the second embodied the more recent phenomena of low, lone wolf terrorism, individuals without any prior formal connection with a terrorist entity who via social media and other communications are radicalized and encouraged to commit acts of violence independently of, but nonetheless on behalf of, or in the service of, or in the service to, the aims of the terrorist organizations inspiring them. ISIS, however, has now perfected a third hybrid option, the so-called enabled attacker. Although this person conforms to the lone wolf model, uh-oh, sorry, lone wolf model, the terrorist command structure in this instance 
directly furnishes this independent operative with very specific, specific targeting instructions with accompanying detailed intelligence, both to promote an attack against this particular target set, but also to appreciably enhance its likelihood of success. Thus, what the FBI calls the flash to bang, the time that it takes a person from, radic from the radicalization process to actually picking up a gun or placing a bomb has been tremendously reduced, making it far more difficult for intelligence and law enforcement to identify, interdict, and thwart terrorist plots. In the final analysis, a terrorist movement's longevity ultimately depends upon its ability to recruit new members as well as to appeal to an expanding pool of both active supporters and passive sympathizers. The role of effective communication in this process is pivotal, ensuring the continued flow of fighters into the movement, binding supporters more tightly to it, and drawing sympathizers more deeply into its orbit. Without communication, Alex Schmidt and Yanni de Graaff presciently argued more than 30 years ago, there can be no terrorism. The revolution in terrorist communications, utilizing social media, has facilitated this process in hitherto unimaginable ways. That it has unfolded so rapidly and become so ubiquitous ensures that terrorist reliance on and exploitation of digital technology is certain to continue. Its immensely appealing capabilities and technologically dynamic products will likely become increasingly more sophisticated in quality, content, rapidity, intimacy, and transmission capacity, and more numerous and pervasive than ever. The implications of this phenomenon are perhaps only now beginning to be understood. What is clear, though, is that as terrorist communications continue to change and evolve, so will the nature of terrorism itself. While one cannot predict what new forms and dimensions terrorism will assume during the rest of the 21st century, this evolutionary process will not only continue, but will be abetted and accelerated by new communications technologies, much as being the case for over a century now. Thank you very much. Thank you.